will call on you. Um, the idea is to get the most information as we can out in an hour. So I know we love to tell war stories. Keep that to a minimum. Uh, just get to the point and ask questions that are going to be relevant to getting your transactions moving. And that will help uh, the general audience that's on. So without further ado. And we will be recording this. Just so I got that question a lot. Uh, this question is being recorded right now. It is being recorded, and let's start off with Bob. Bob, why don't you hit it with uh, with some of your thoughts, and then we'll open it up to questions, and I'm kind of monitoring the time, so we'll keep moving. Okay, <clears throat> feel free to interrupt me. Uh, David, thanks for organizing this. Jennifer, thanks for coordinating this, and uh, and it's important. It's uh, uh, As a veteran of Katrina, I, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I saw things, and there's things I did well and things I wish we'd have done differently. And so we'll talk about it. And what I'd like to talk about are the top five things every real estate agent should be doing post IDA. Um, first, first and foremost, let's make it easy. Get back in the game. And what I mean by that is communicate with your clients. You might have, we have roof damage. We still at our house don't have internet, but a lot of people don't have electricity or internet. Um, actually, I've been getting more sleep because I'm not watching stupid television. So it's actually pretty good. Uh, but, but get back in the game. Communicate with your past clients and let them know that you're here. You're willing to work with them. Communicate with your current clients to make sure that they're up to date. Uh, and, and doing it. I found that people after Katrina, agents who came back and really worked on it, uh, got, got into the game. And if you have damage to your house, you have to go meet your adjuster. You have to go do those things. But but I find it sometimes therapeutic to get back into the what you were used to doing, you know, getting up in the morning, make your list of what you want to do. How many, you know, am I going to call five clients today? Am I going to email 10 people? Do something so it keeps you being relevant and keeps you at the forefront. Because some people are going to decide, I am not going to fix up my house or I'm going to go move forward or uh, I want to change houses or I didn't have damage, but I'm looking to move to a different neighborhood. So, so be out there, be communicating with them. That's first and foremost. Secondly is the property disclosure form. <clears throat> it is imperative that you let your sellers know that they have to at least look at the property disclosure form to see if there is any damage at all. I mean, for the most part, some people had some form of damage. Uh, we, all of our offices, we have six. Destrahan is shut down for now, but they're working out of Metairie. Metairie, we had power until today, and then it went out, and I just talked to Danny Douglas, and we're back on. So we've got power there. Maple Street's up and running, internet power. Uh, uh, historic office on Burgundy, on the Legion Fields in, in Burgundy is up and running. We have power and internet. Um, we've got it at, at a Lakeview office. So if you need a place to even go and say, look, I just want to drop it. There's a guy downstairs from one of the real estate companies who's, who's working on something because he doesn't have internet. You're welcome to use our offices because candidly, we're not slammed with closings right now. So we have space and we have time. Uh, we're doing closings. We, we have two scheduled today. We did three yesterday. We did two Fridays. So uh, some are able to get closed and want to get closed. <clears throat> so, so get back in the game update the property disclosure form, make sure that's done. If there was a roof issue, if anybody's filing a claim, at the very least, that seller has to at least make the disclosure because it's hard to say that I had no damage yet, I filed a claim. Third is what's the update with courthouses? So Orleans Parish will not be physically in the office until a week from this coming Monday. Uh, I think they probably could get back sooner, but I don't run that shop, So, <clears throat> but they're there. Jefferson Parish was trying to open and believe it or not, they got hit with a ransomware attack. So the Jefferson Parish records are technically down right now. Uh, most of the other parishes were able to get in and operate into, and we can still close in Orleans, and we can still uh, get up and running, and we may be able to, in some instances, close in Jefferson because one of our abstractors has a huge database. So that, that allows us to get some things closed that maybe maybe we can't. <clears throat> you know, now more than ever, it's important to be working with people you trust and people who are good. And I say that, and I talk about lenders. I mean, look for a lender, a local lender, somebody that you can talk to, somebody who's dealing with it. You know, some of the ladies downstairs are bewildered when they talk to someone out of state who has no idea that we went through a hurricane, no idea what's involved or anything else. So using local insurance companies, using local lenders, using, you know, your the Ladder Bloom family, those, um, you know, using a local title company that knows what's going on and how to maneuver it is more important than ever. Even if it's an eighth of an interest rate higher, <clears throat> getting to the table is more important uh, at the end of the day than doing something else. So, so use those people. But the courthouses are getting back up and running, but we're able to close, we're able to get things recorded and, and move forward. So if you've got something pending, it can get done. Yeah, we, we, we can do it. And, and, and so can others who are back up and running. Fourth is you know, back to can I get to the closing table? And I'm going to elaborate that on a little bit more. If you have a hurricane addendum, kudos, you did a good job. You signed that hurricane addendum and it, it gives an automatic extension to the contract. 
If you don't have the hurricane addendum, then we all know that the purchase agreement that LREC puts out does not provide for an automatic extension. It doesn't give an extension for force majeure. It didn't give an extension for COVID and it doesn't give an extension for a hurricane. So you're now stuck in a situation where you don't have it. So let me give you the story of one that we just worked out yesterday. We had a seller who's an older lady who said she cannot move out of the property yet. She can't get her movers. She called all over with different moving companies. The, the only one that would do it was one out of Florida, but they would only do it if she put them up in a hotel and she said, oh, I can't put them up in a hotel. So we got that. So she couldn't do it. <clears throat> the closing deadline was yesterday, Wednesday. No extension because there was no hurricane addendum. They were not letter and bloom agents, FYI. Uh, so then the um, buyer wants to force her to close Friday but the contract deadline was yesterday. So the buyer says, give me an extension till Friday and I wanna close Friday. And the seller says, no, give me an extension till next Thursday so I have time to get my things moved out. So it became a real shooting match between the two of them as far as what's gonna happen. The buyer thought they were right. The buyer's boyfriend's an attorney and he wanted to sue. And now they're talking lawsuits. And the seller says, bring it on, I got my attorney. And so it was deteriorating really fast. And yesterday with a number of phone calls, we worked out a solution. And the solution was simply, let's extend it till Wednesday p.m. because that's when they lost their interest rate. So Wednesday at four o'clock, they're on the books to close. The seller's gonna have her stuff out. And if not, there may be some kind of holdback. They even had a solution that they'd close this Friday and the seller for every day she wasn't out would be charged $500. She wouldn't go for that because she's mad that she had to spend $1,000 cleaning up the yard. And I nicely told her that you have to give the property in the same or better condition. So it wasn't nice of her to do it. It was an obligation for her to do it. But so the, the solution is to push the closing back and then the buyers wanted to close Friday and then let her stay in and do an escrow agreement. <clears throat> and I said, this is a recipe for disaster. I said, you're forcing your closing. Let's go to Wednesday. But now set for Wednesday, it is an extension signed and everybody's good. This is sometimes how you work it out. And sometimes you guys, you, you know, you, you have to have, a, a, a even if it's not a formal degree, an un, informal degree in psychology and working with people and dealing with people. People are stressed right now. They're, they're upset because their mom's living with them. They're upset because you know, we had a bunch of people staying with us and, and uh, it's a relief to have family members going from the house now. Uh, family members and their kids and their kids' friends and more importantly, their dogs, it's just too many dogs. But so you all know where I'm coming from in some instances. Uh, but in that instance, in that instance, try to talk people off the ledge. I mean, sometimes it's like, hey, let's do an extension for a week. Let's get everything calmed down. Let's get everything good. We have some buyers who are panicking and wanted to back out of contract. Same thing. Hey, let's do an extension for a week. And then you can make your determination then as far as what's going on. Uh, the buyer still has a right to back out if they don't have loan approval. So uh, if they, in that instance, the one we had yesterday where they were fighting back and forth, my point was, seller, you want to sell, buyer, you want to buy. Neither can force the other one because the lender couldn't be ready yesterday. So stop, think about it, and do the extension. And that's that's how they did it. Um, look for look for the interest rate. Some lenders are, are doing an automatic two-week extension. Some are doing less. Some lenders are requiring that the property be reinspected, and that's something in you know, talking with your lender. What are they requiring? Some are requiring that. Uh, the appraiser go back and reinspect. Uh, some are requiring that um, that pictures be taken of the property, and that's up to the lender and the underwriter in that particular instance. Really important if you represent a buyer and they're buying a house, that it is well worth the two or three hundred dollars they have the same inspector who inspected a month ago to come back out and reinspect just for peace of mind. Put that in, in an email to your clients. Hey, I strongly suggest that we get. Joe Smith, the uh, the uh, inspector who inspected, just to come back and do another check because sometimes there may be hidden damage and once it closes, it, it's closed. If you buy it as is with waiver redhibition and the seller didn't know about it, that buyer is taking the property subject to that. And then the uh, number number five would be leases and landlord tenants. We've had a lot of questions on that. Um, it, it sometimes depends on what your lease says. Is, is does a tenant owe rent while there's no electricity? <clears throat> Most what you want to make sure you have in your your lease, if you don't have it now down the road, is a clause that says regardless of whether electricity is on or out, as long as it's not caused by an electrical panel problem or problem with the property itself, that rent still still owed. Um, we we've got one property where there's still no electricity to it, and we're going to work with those people. We we work. Sometimes you can treat. I would take your 10-year tenant who's been there and loyally paid your rent and done done better. Treat them treat them well. It might mean splitting the rent or not splitting the rent. The argument is, why am I paying rent if I, if it's not 
habitable. Well, remember, the assessor's charging the property owner taxes for the days it wasn't habitable. The uh, insurance company's charging insurance for the days it wasn't habitable. And the l l lender is charging interest for the days it wasn't, wasn't habitable. But you can always change it. You can always treat someone better than uh, if they're a good tenant. To, to legally, legally discriminate is good. To illegally discriminate race, sex, religion, national origin, color, creed, sex is illegal. Stay away from it. Don't do it. But, but to take care of that person who's been a good tenant, who, you know, we went by one of our properties and the guy's out there with his girlfriend sweeping up the street. And I'm like, you know, this is, this is a good tenant. We're going to get him a $100 Rouse's card just to say, hey, good job. I walked by uh, Washington Square uh, in the Marigny the, the other day. Um, what was it, Monday? Monday. And there's this maybe 35-year-old woman out there. She's sweeping the sidewalks of Washington Square. And I said, gosh, we need more people like you. She's doing the, but well, half the people can't get out and sweep in front of their house. And she's out sweeping the public sidewalk around the park. And it's just, those are good things. Those are good things that people can do. I even took a picture of her because I want to keep it in my memory. It's somebody who's out there hustling and doing and doing a good job. But but look for the tenants. And I'm not saying, if you, if you hang up and say, Bob Bergeron with Crescent Title said we should charge tenants even if it wasn't habitable. I'm not saying that. I'm saying work with your tenants. Uh, we had one tenant who was bad before the storm. We filed an eviction before the storm. She was stealing electricity from the neighbor who didn't know it. Um, she was having people come in and out at all hours of the night, lots of things. And finally, yesterday, we told her we would give her $250 in cash plus her deposit if she moved out just to get rid of her so we can get a good tenant in there, somebody who takes care of the property. She took us up on the offer. We gave her her $750 uh, rental deposit plus $250, $1,000 cash. She was happy. We're happy. We don't have to go through the eviction proceeding and you know, life can go on. So sometimes you know, money talks and if you can get money to some of those people to do it. If you're looking for an email to send out to your past clients, you might pull up WWL posted where uh, the um, you, people can get reimbursed up to $800 for a generator, up to $250 for a chainsaw, and perhaps some living expenses and $500. So maybe just something to post out there to show that. If you go on our Facebook page and we've sent out a lot of emails about what to do if a neighbor's tree falls on my property, what to do with property, any of those things, feel free to grab it and send it out. And, uh, you don't you don't have to give us credit. Just we're trying to get information out. It's good information. But but in sum, if you want to get to the closing table, we can get there. If you've got a, a buyer or seller who's panicking, who's on the ledge and you can't talk them off, say, look, why don't we jump on? And even if it's closing somewhere else, it's not the end of the world for us. Get us on the phone. You got me, you got Laura, you have Kendra, Ian, uh, Jason. We've got all kinds of attorneys, Danny. And uh, we'll jump on a call, and sometimes we can help talk somebody off of, off the ledge and explain to them why. I go back to COVID, and this woman, her financial advisor, said this is a horrible time to be buying a house. This was last March or April, and she was ready to back out. We kind of chatted. I wasn't in the in the mindset to convince her otherwise, but but I one of my things was you've got to have a place to live. And he was trying to convince her with her two kids, her husband had passed away, to get an apartment. And I'm thinking maybe this guy doesn't want her spending the money on a house he wants to invest in for. But at the end of the day, she went forward with the sale. I always look back and think her property value is up probably 15% as a result of that decision. And she's got a place to live and her kids have a good place to live. Sometimes it's simply taking a deep breath, talking to people, trying to convince them why were you buying in the first place, why you were selling in the first place. And lastly is that if people want to retain their insurance claim, so I am selling my house to David and I have roof damage and I have some other damage, but he still wants to go forward and buy. We can put money in escrow. I can agree to pay for his roof, but I retain the insurance claim. And what I need is, and, and we can prepare that document. It's called a retention of insurance claim that Bob Bergeron gets to keep the claim. David agrees to cooperate. David will let my adjuster go in next week or next month or six months from now to go in and he'll cooperate with me in allowing me to settle that claim. And when I do settle it, I get to keep the money. And then the other way to do it, and it's not for the faint of heart, is sometimes an investor might come and Mrs. Jones just doesn't have the ability mentally, doesn't have the ability emotionally, doesn't have the ability financially to redo the house. And this investor will buy the property and get it up and, and she will assign her insurance claim to him and let him go work it. So he gives her 100000 for the house and he takes over the insurance claim and we can prepare that. It's an assignment of insurance claim where she agrees to cooperate and work with him and getting that claim settled. And then at the end of the day, that buyer gets whatever insurance money that buyer, buyer can get. It's important that that buyer has read her policy, looks at the deductible and make sure that they know what they're doing. But that's that's got it. 
So I'll, I know we've got some other people on the call, so I'll, I'll back off. But if you, you know, and I'll hang on. But if you've got a question, please ask. And if you've got a question down the road, give us a, give us a holler. We're, we're around. We're working. That's perfect, Bob. And you must have been looking at my notes because that was the last thing I wanted you to touch on was about uh, insurance, either retaining or assigning and the ways to navigate that. I know we're stepping a little bit on Justin's um, territory there, but I wanted you to touch on that. Guys, we're going to move on to uh, Justin Thibodeau with uh, Ladder and Bloom Insurance, but I just want to urge you to get your questions into the chat box. Bob's going to hang on for the hour. Bob, I'm obligating you to an hour. I hope you're all right with that. Um, and if not, we'll, okay. we'll, yeah, we'll get you to answer them later. And then sure. uh, at the end, if there are any questions that are still unanswered, uh, either Jennifer or I will reach out to these experts, get those answered, and we'll figure out how to get those to you. Justin, you want to take it away? This is Justin Thibodeau with uh, Ladder and Bloom Insurance. Most of you guys are familiar with them. Um, powered by Hartwig Moss, uh, industry expert and uh, a veteran. Justin, why don't you take it away? You're still muted, I think, bud. Justin, can you hear me? All right, he might be frozen. Let's move on and uh, pivot over uh, to Fred. Fred, can you take it away? Fred is uh, a loan officer with the Central Mortgage, been in the business a long time, super knowledgeable, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about what's going on with loans uh, around post-IDA, not just for Essential Mortgage, but talking uh, in broad strokes about the industry. Fred, do you want to take that? All right. Jen, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Um, Fred, are you there? He's, he, Fred is muted. I saw Justin was unmuted, but he just left the call. I think he's joined again. Um, now Fred is unmuted. Great. Right, Justin's back on. Justin, can we hear you? Oh, hello. Yes, I can hear, I can hear Fred, I think. Go ahead, Justin. I think we're still having issues with Justin's. All right, well, good. This is Fred. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up here. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about. Thank, Thank you, Fred. Okay, good. Uh, just a few things to, to, to talk about this morning regarding mortgage uh, servicing and, and loans that are currently in process of being closed and purchases that, that are sort of in the middle after uh, after the storm. Um, interest rate extension as you know mortgage companies typically lock interest rates based upon um, the timing required to get the loan closed we do 30-day lock we do 45-day locks we try to try to lock the loan based on when, you, when you want to close um, jonah has not answered me short, back yet a, a short rate lock is better pricing than a longer rate lock so we try to we try to keep those in, in sync with one another. But the situation now where you, you've got the purchases that are being held off on due to damage to homes or people not being able to get loans closed in time, you have a situation where interest rates are expiring. And all lenders operate differently on how they uh, will extend interest rates. Some will do like a lot of the business. We're a broker. A lot of the companies we do business with will do free seven days up to 15 day extensions without a cost to the borrower. Some of them um, require a two basis point per day extension. So say for a week extension on a rate on an interest rate lock would cost the borrower up to an eighth. So if you've got clients who are in a situation where they've not closed and their rate is expiring, they need to contact their lender to determine what can be done to extend that rate. One good thing is we're in a rate environment where interest rates for the last 30 to 45 days have not changed. And in some cases, the rates have actually gone down a bit. So um, you, can, you can actually let the current rate expire and relock it the next day now you can't relock it at the lower rate of the market, but you can many times relock it at the at the rate that you had going into the uh, into the contract. So, um, but it's important that the, the your clients contact their mortgage lender and see what's available to them. Now, I do know that, like I said, some some lenders are offering free extensions for a week up to 15 days in some cases. But I will also tell you that in a lot of cases the the um, 
rate extension fee is negotiable. So uh, I would I would suggest you talk to the lender and say, hey, what can you do to help me? We're in a situation where it's not the, 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 the purchaser's fault that we had this hurricane. It's not, you know, it's out of everyone's control. And you hate to see somebody get taken advantage of to extend an interest rate when uh, when something could be done maybe to lower that cost associated with it. So I would say, hey, make sure your client contacts the lender and say, what's available to me? But I would look at just letting that rate expire and, and find out at that point what what the interest rate would be. And, and I think most cases you're going to see that the rate will be the same as it was as it was previously locked. Um, but again, have them contact their lenders and uh, if you have any questions about it, call me. I can explain hopefully uh, what they should do. Um, another big issue right now on loans on properties that have been appraised but not yet closed is the lenders are going to require a reinspection of that property. And reinspections again uh, come in different shapes and, 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 and sizes uh, depending on who the lender is. Most Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac lenders are going to require that the appraiser or not necessarily the original appraiser, but a licensed appraiser go back out and reinspect that property and prepare a uh, uh, disaster inspection form uh, along with pictures stating that the house had no damage and there's no adverse impact on the value of the home due to the storm. Some lenders may require or may allow that the an officer of the company, of the lending company, go out, take pictures of the the home and certify on behalf of the lender that no damage is done and let that loan go ahead and close at some point. Again, it's it depends on who the lender is and what their what their requirement is. But for the most part, you're going to see that uh, the lenders are going to require that an appraiser go back out and inspect that property and complete that disaster inspection report. Um, one thing we've experienced in the last week is we have a number of homes that have to be reinspected. And appraisers, like a lot of us, evacuated last week and are just now coming back into the market, back in to, to do this reinspection. So they're they're behind. It's taking you know as much as a week to ten days to get these homes reinspected. So uh, we're asking our our borrowers, our clients, to be patient, and we're everybody has the same goal to get this thing to closing as quickly as possible. But uh, we do have to ask everyone to be patient because we we cannot control. When an appraiser goes out and, and, and does it, they're doing them as quickly as they can and to get them back to us as quickly as possible. But it's, you know, it is a process. Um, one other thing, I guess we're going to see a lot of people who are getting claims who have, are going to be filing claims with their insurance companies for damage. And just to talk a little bit about the claim service and what mortgage companies are, are doing in that respect. I know it's, uh, I can remember back in Katrina that people were them in mean, lines going out the door of, of, of uh, banks and mortgage companies trying to get checks and doors and funds uh, distributed to, to get homes fixed. The way it works, I mean, you're going to have to contact your mortgage servicer. And typically what they will do is the loan is current and there's a, a differentiation between whether that loan is current at the time of the disaster or past due at the time of the disaster. If the loan is current or no more than 30 days late at the time of the disaster, when those checks are, are, are uh, distributed by the insurance company, when, when those checks are mailed out, the, the, the insured will need to contact their mortgage servicer and Typically, what the mortgage service will, will, will do is if, if the claim check is less than $40,000 $40, or less, they will release those funds, 100% of those funds, to the, to the, to the, uh, the homeowner to let them do the repairs, to get the home fixed, and get people in to, to do the work. Typically, if the claims are more than $40,000, they'll endorse the check over to the, servicing, over to the mortgage servicing company those funds will be placed in an escrow account. The servicer will then distribute up to $40,000 to the borrower, to the, to the homeowner, for them to start doing their um, renovations and repairs and whatnot. And they'll keep the remaining funds in that escrow account and, and will distribute it thereafter based upon 
um, periodic inspections of the home to see what's been done to make sure that, that the work has been done satisfactorily and the contractor, well, the funds would be released to pay the contractor during that, that point in time. But typically anything $40,000 or less, the lender will just endorse this, give that money back to the to the homeowner, let them do their repairs. Anything over and above forty thousand dollars, they will they will uh, they'll give them up to the forty. Pardon me, they'll give them up to the forty thousand dollars, and as for the remaining, uh, to be distributed as as the work is done. If the loan is past due, at um, each each one of those cases are, are looked at individually. Obviously, what the service is going to do is, is take a portion of that money, maybe to help get that loan current, or at least work out terms with the borrower, with the homeowner to get the loans current, and distribute funds thereafter to to, to make the uh, improvements to the property. But uh, you know, they, they were, that's on an individual basis, and um, that they'll do that as as needed. But uh, I guess the biggest thing is is make sure that your your clients on the extension, you know, they check their interest rates, see how long they have left on it before they close, and to contact their mortgage lender and say, hey, what can you do to help me extend this rate? But I think in most cases you're going to find that since the market has not changed in the last 30 to 45 days, there would not be there should not be a significant change in rate if they decide just to let the current rate expire and 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 take a a market rate at this point. Or if, if so, they can look at what it's going to cost to extend um, the rate for a, a seven or fifteen or thirty day period, whether whatever is required at that point. So, um, and I'm open for any questions anybody may have. Um, hope everybody did in the storm and then is doing well. Fred, thank you. Um, I just want to, uh, to point out to you that um, Bob is talking uh, from Title is talking a little bit about insurance and a little about lending, and Fred talking about Title and insurance. It shows you how all of these are integrated. Um, Fred, if you would hang on the call in case some uh, questions come up. I want to pivot back to Bob just for a second. Can you clear a couple of things in the chat screen? Ben Samuels asks. Um, first of all, he thanks you, and then he says, "Can you elaborate on how closings are happening without courthouses being open?" <clears throat> sure. Um, and not everyone's able to close. We deal with four different underwriters and they have different opinions on what happens when the courthouse is closed and not able to close. Uh, we've gotten at least two of the four that say we can close and we've already arranged with the courthouse. We have our courier going to, we're putting him in order, the stack of recording, and he will be the first in line uh, at 7 a.m. He's assured me to be there to record. So right when the courthouse opens, we'll get everything recorded and put in under the theory that nothing is being recorded right now anyway. Uh, and um, you know, one of our big title insurance underwriters has said, no, you have to wait. Uh, another one said, pause it for now, we'll let you know. And the other two are giving us the go ahead and, and uh, taking the risk. Now, with that said, we're closing, I would tell you we're not closing Ben 100% of things, but we're closing 80 to 90%. So we had one yesterday that was, we had the four successions or probates in the chain of title, and it went back to 1951. Well, those records aren't accessible at the courthouse. So that's one that we can't close. And we asked them to get an extension to the end of the month, and, and they did. Uh, that's a curative issue. So it automatically extends it in the curative clause, or it may extend it in the hurricane addendum. So uh, when I say we can close 80 to 90%, that's the only one so far that we have not been able to close. And we've closed probably between our offices 15 or maybe 20 so far. All right. And Bob, uh, Troy Lynn Peralt asks, any idea when the courthouses will open? Are you getting any indication there? Yeah, the Orleans Parish Courthouse will open a week from Monday. Uh, Jefferson Parish says that they're going to be open on Monday. Uh, and St. Charles Parish may have to relocate. St. Bernard Parish, I believe, is opened. And um, Plaquemines, I, 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 I'm not sure on that one. All right, great. Great questions. All right, I am going to turn it over to Justin um, with much anticipation. We finally have audio <laughs> working, and Justin's going to take over. And Justin, uh, before you get going, I just want to uh, read a question that's in the chat screen that's going to affect you. Um, we have someone saying that they were supposed to have had a deal that closed on August 31st. It didn't because the buyer said they could not get insurance. Shouldn't they have had insurance in place is one question. You can either address that or not. And um, shouldn't they be able to, to secure that now? So you can just stick that in the back of your head or start with that. However, is best for you, Justin, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll start with that. Uh, so insurance is definitely going to be a huge uh, obstacle that many of you are going to be facing over the next few weeks. Um, hopefully, things are going to start stabling out uh, very quickly, but 
um, we're starting to see um, more like a post-Katrina insurance market right now. And that's currently the state that things are in. Um, that policy theoretically should have already been bound and in place. Um, once a policy is bound and in place, they can't rescind that. Um, that being said, if that agent had to push the closing date back, that's when it could potentially become ineligible. Um, so that could be where the issue fell into place. Um, now, just to tear into things, I'm going to talk about homeowners insurance and just the current market. I'm going to touch on flood real quick because um, that's a huge thing and, and there's some big stuff that is happening within the next 30 days. And then, you know, I can go into the claims process um, if that's something. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine, Justin. And I think you hit the high points of you think of what you think is critical for us to know to help us move forward. And then if we if that opens up some more questions, we'll we'll go from there. But I trust your judgment as to where you're going to take us. Okay, sounds great. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, my internet is super super choppy. Um, so homeowners insurance carriers have not reinstated binding authority in affected areas as they have previously done so. Of the 28 or so carriers in the independent market. Uh, marketplace, only three standard market carriers have reinstated authority. Uh, to date, those carriers are Southern Fidelity Insurance, Vault, and Pure, and also just found that the National General has reinstated that. Gulf States is still set to return on October the 1st, um, and there are three surplus lines carriers that are accepting new business. Um, that being said, if, if a client is closing soon um, and they have already received insurance quotes, they're going to want to definitely reach out to their insurance agent um, to make sure that those quotes are still are still valid. Um, even if you haven't had a loss, it's a great time to take out your current policy and you know certainly review those policies. Um, uh, and look at your deductibles. Make sure to really take note of that. Most policies have a hurricane deductible. Some policies will have a wind or hail or name storm deductible, and it can be as low as a thousand dollars or as high as ten percent. Um, the carriers that have closed, many of them the most competitive, um, they're just saying right now that they need to assess the overall loss that they've received before they can re-enter the marketplace. So we're hopeful that that will be within the next few weeks, um, but this is something where they can stay closed for a period of time. Um, as far as flood insurance, um, please remember that the National Flood Insurance Program is still set to expire if Congress is not reauthorized. NFIP by 1159 on September the 30th. Um, the negotiations of that could have an impact on the new risk rating 2.0, which is in place um, to start on all new business effective on or after October the 1st. Um, know that cash sales that have a 30, they will have a 30 day wait, of course, um, if they're not assuming policies. Um, that will put them after that date. So if the sellers don't have a current policy, um, those rates will go into effect the new risk rating 2.0. Um, when working with the listing, it's more important now than ever that you include the seller's flood insurance declaration. If there is a flood insurance policy in place, this will be needed by the buyer's insurance agent to carry over um, the insurance rating, the discounts and credits that are currently on there. Um, if the buyer doesn't, or if the seller doesn't have a, a flood insurance policy in place, that's whenever those new higher rates will, will go into effect. And just to give you a brief example, I can tell you my own property. I live here in Gretna, uh, very close to the levee. I'm in a preferred flood zone. Um, if I let my policy lapse and I had to purchase a new policy, if someone were to buy my home and I didn't have insurance, that rate instead of 572 per year would be 3526. Um, so this is completely uh, not like I thought it was going to be at all. Um, it's certainly going to present many obstacles for many of you. And if you have any questions about that or anything, reach out to me or your Ladder and Bloom Insurance Service agent in your marketplace. Um, as far as the claims process, if you are intending to put in an insurance claim in place, you should first report your claims to your insurance agent or your carrier directly as soon as possible. Uh, claims are, of course, uh, completely backing up. Um, gather all receipts and documentation from the date of the loss through the time that you returned. Also, save any receipts used to mitigate future losses. Take photos of all, all of the interior and exterior damage. You'll want to start getting quotes from trades or contractors as soon as possible, but don't start work uh, until this has been approved by your adjuster. 
The exception to that would be if uh, you're mitigating future losses, such as tarping a roof, putting an overlayment on it, or securing an open of your home, cutting back trees, those types of things. Uh, from there, claims adjuster would reach out directly to the insured uh, to go over the loss detail, set expectations, and set a time to review the damage. An adjuster will come out, review the damage to the property, and collect documentation for the claim. Then a final loss summary will be sent over to the insured uh, from the carrier. They'll have an opportunity to discuss that uh, and go over the next steps. Um, Keep in mind, if you have any issues throughout this process, that's whenever the client would definitely want to reach out to the agent of that policy directly. Um, and if you have any issues from there, keep in mind, of course, that the Louisiana Department of Insurance does govern these things as well. All right. Uh, Justin, uh, we have a question in the chat box. When you talk about uh, preferred zones, are you talking about X flood zone? So I am, I'm talking about X, B, and C. There, there are, by National Flood Insurance Program standards, there is no more of a preferred flood zone. Uh, it's a high risk or a low risk flood zone. Um, but, you know, I spoke with Fred real briefly this morning. Um, as far as we know, the lenders aren't looking at it any differently. So if it's in those same, if it's in a flood zone A or flood zone B, the lenders are still going to require it. They haven't received any changes uh, about any other flood zones. Um, I hope that answers the question. It does. Uh, we also have another question. Can you please repeat the company's issuing uh, insurance in the um, for new buyers? So on the standard market side, right now we just have Southern Fidelity and National General. Um, as far as the, the high net worth on the standard market side, we've got Vault and Pure. Um, on surplus, side of things. Lloyd's isn't even back. Um, there's just Scottsdale, Evanston, and Beasley. Fortunately, uh, Southern Fidelity and Scottsdale are the two condo carriers um, that are in the market right now, so, so that's great. At least we still have them. Uh, but I mean, some of the, not to discredit Southern Fidelity and um, National General, I mean, they're great companies, but the most competitive carriers that we're tending to work with, the ones that are rated AM's best, uh, that have really great financial ratings, they're out of the market right now. And they're reassessing their overall uh, losses before they re-enter. So hopefully that will be soon. But um, just keep in mind that insurance rates are going to be higher. If somebody's already pre-approved, that's probably on the condition of, uh, you know, that might be on a condition of the insurance being at a lower amount than what it's going to be. So um, all of those could be big things. And I mean, right, so if, another question. If your you know that your damage will not meet the deductible, should you file a claim? So you want to keep in mind that the hurricane and name storm deductibles, that is per calendar year. So any damages from this, if it's not enough to meet your deductible this go around, if we have any additional losses throughout the, the year, um, then it, it may go above that number. So um, that's certainly up to you. Uh, everyone should keep in mind that a catastrophe claim or an act of God um, loss, uh, it cannot be negatively, uh, cannot negatively impact your policy. Your rates can't go up from that. You can't be denied coverage. Justin, you're a mind reader. That was the second half of the question that I was going to tip to you. They're wanting to know if it'll impact future homeowner and you just answered that. And Frank, the other thing that I'll add real briefly about the... Yeah. You might have seen the on the news this morning, they were talking about ALE, uh, assisted living expenses, and also loss of use and, and what the Louisiana Department of Insurance State Commissioner put out in his memo um, directive. Um, that's something that you're going to want to reach out directly to your insurance agent and see if that coverage is on your policy. Not all policies are written equally. Um, and then I'll just last but not least add, uh, you know, this is one of those things. This is this is why it's important for your client to have a relationship with their insurance agent and go over these questions and have an opportunity to discuss their coverages. You want to try not to get in the way of that because in the time of a loss, they don't care who put what in place. They care about what coverages they have. So it's it's really great opportunity um, to look at that. Uh, you know, that's why we like to have very detailed, in-depth conversations with our clients uh, to go over their options so they know what they're looking at in the time such as these. Got it. Uh, Bob, I have one for you. This is going to be a curveball. It was just emailed to me to ask you. 
Um, could you ask Bob if a tenant can require an inspector to be vaccinated to come inside of their home? Yes, that's a curveball. I think we have a bad connection, David. I'm not going to be able to answer this. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, right now, a tenant is very powerful. A tenant can almost do whatever they want because there's nothing you can do with the civil authorities going to court and forcing that. If you call the police, they're going to say it's a civil matter. So the answer is the, a tenant can do almost anything they want right now, and there's nothing legally you can do about it. So... Um, so the answer is practically yes, legally probably no, but nobody wants to go enforce that. So let me try to give you, when, when, this is not something anybody wants to litigate. So we shouldn't, we won't be seeing a case on that. So let me go, let me tell you the practical answer is try to reason with the tenant. Try to tell the tenant, look, how about if I give you a $50 gift card to Rouse's and you go shopping, let me bring the, the guy there, I'll make him wear masks, make him wear two masks, I'll make him wear gloves, and let me bring them through the property, take pictures, get out of there while you're away. Or I'll feed you at uh, uh, Vincent's down the street or Fresca's down the street or wherever, wherever's open. And, uh, and, and try to, try, it, it calls for a practical answer. Try to negotiate with the tenant, give them something. It's worth $100. It's worth $200 if you have to. Excellent. Um, Justin, uh, I have a question back for you. Uh, an owner's tree falls on his own fence. Is it covered by homeowners? An owner's tree falls on their on their own fence is it covered? So I'm not going to determine coverage uh, because again, not all policies are created equally. There's homeowners insurance policies, there's dwelling insurance policies. It's kind of one of those things uh, that's something that you would the claims adjuster is the only one that can determine coverage. Um, I can say that I don't see why that would be excluded, but again, I can't determine policy. Uh, I can't determine coverage on a policy. Certainly one that I'm not looking at. Excellent. Hey, David, you want me to jump in a little bit on that? And I, and Justin, I'm not trying to, I'm not an insurance agent. Uh, but, but, but there's, um, you're right, you got to look, each policy is different. But from a legal standpoint, I can jump in there. Um, you can file your claim, but from a legal standpoint, if usually typically, as long as the owner of the tree doesn't know that it's bad, so it's an act of God, a hurricane, then that owner of the tree is not responsible. Um, the the damage caused by the tree you, you'd work it out between the owners typically insurance companies pay if, if my tree falls on david's property and causes damage to his property typically his insurance company will will pay for that unless it was a rotten tree and i had reason to know that it was rotten and i knew, didn't do anything about it uh, but whether that's covered in your policy itself is between you i just wanted to jump in because a lot of people were calling and saying hey my neighbor's tree fell on my house and my neighbor won't do anything about it or more importantly my neighbor won't let me go on his property to cut it off of my house. And so, again, we're back to nobody's going to the courthouse right now to do anything, to talk with the neighbor, sign an indemnity, hold harmless, whatever you need to do to get, get that done and talk them off the ledge or invite them to go to dinner and still don't show up and then go hurry up and cut the tree while they're gone. No, don't do that. Just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you clarified. All yes. right, listen, guys, we have uh, 14 minutes left in this call. Do we have any other questions? And uh, for any, for Justin, for Bob, or for Fred, you can either get them into the chat screen or you can um, uh, unmute your mic and jump in. We have 15 minutes left. Anybody have anything that we did not touch on? This is Keith. I actually need a little clarification. Go. So, Bob, Kirk is going to close on a house for me September 28th, okay? Um, but I got this message from the insurance company, and it says the financing will need to be postponed until any needed repairs are made to the property. Can't finance the home if damaged or with insurance claims in process. So we know there's roof damage. They were having an insurance adjuster go look at it either today or tomorrow. Um what can I do in this case if this is a note from the lender saying we can't finance the home if damaged with insurance claims in process? And this is for anybody who can answer that. Yeah, I'll jump in is that, that the, um, you can finance, you can buy a home with an insurance claim pending and with damage. It becomes harder if you're trying to finance a home, finance a home with an insurance claim or damage. So in that instance, it's up to the particular lender. If you're dealing with your lender, I was talking with one of the bank, Gulf Coast Bank yesterday, and the guy said, we're coming out with a new product that is more a little bit higher end construction or renovation loan. So somebody who has damage can go borrow money 
and finance it and then go with the long term, the 30 year loan. You might. So you may have to do sort of a construction or a bank bank loan to get to the table or you know, each lender may be different and each underwriter for that lender may be different. They may let you put money aside to do the repairs and get it done. But if there's damage to the property, they may not be able to lend on that property. It, it's each All right. different product determines it. All right. John Myers has his hand raised. Go, John. <clears throat> I'm actually going to turn it over to Linda Babineau. Go, Linda. Hi. Uh, yesterday, I had an interesting email from a lender who said that there was a new disaster FHA loan and you could borrow the full FHA amount and you could still uh, have the seller pay 6% and that people should call in to see uh, whatever their damage is to see if they qualify. That's all that I know about it. Are you done? Justin, do you know anything about that? Um, in regards to disaster assistance and taking over the existing loan? Yes. Was that the question? Okay. Um, I mean, I've heard a little bit about that. And if someone does uh, an SBA loan uh, for disaster assistance, depending on the amount of the loan, that is something that the lender could, um, that will allow um, them to roll in the whole loan amount including the existing loan that's on the property. But um, that's really all I know about. I just read a little bit on FEMA's website. All right, perfect. Um, next question is from Troy, Troy Land Peral. Um, can you hear me? We can. Um, okay, my first question is for Bob. Bob, is First American uh, 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 allowing closings to happen without the courthouse being open? Uh, currently, First American is not allowing closings, but they are in certain instances. Each one's case by case with them. They okay. And my, thank you. And my second question is for Justin. Justin, when you were using your house as an example, your flood insurance as an example of uh, rates going up, I think you said like if you were in a preferred and or in a preferred and and I think you said that if the policy laps, that it could be much higher. Can you clarify what you said about that again? Thanks. Um, yeah, so if you let your policy lapse, um, you do have a 30-day period of time to make the still make the policy payment. Um, but if you let the policy lapse and it's past that period of time and the policy can't be reinstated, then it could be forced to go into the new risk rating 2.0, um, which it would have then a higher rate. I mean, I, and, and the area is choppy. I didn't quote anything on the North Shore yet. I mean, we've been, you know, focusing on claims. But, um, again, I don't have a severe pattern of lost property or anything. So, I mean, this would be really relevant to a client buying a house that um, is in a preferred flood zone. The seller didn't have a policy because they didn't need to by lending standards. Um, then that's whenever they're going to have those new higher rates. Now, other than that, I mean, I could say that, our policy is going to go up 18% per year until it hits that number. So, I mean, it's going to take, you know, a couple decades to really get that high, but um, you know, th that's essentially it. I mean, you, you really want right now more than ever, everyone needs to pay attention to their renewals and also their flood insurance, their flood and homeowners insurance renewals um, to be sure that their lender pays um, or that it's client paid uh, by those amount. Also, you want to take note to any coverage changes because uh, some carriers are adding uh, actual cash value to their roofs um, because, you know, the roofs are aging out. And you'll only know that if you actually read through your policy documents that come in. Justin, I have another question for you. In loss of use for damages preventing the ability to live in property, is loss of use only for damages preventing ability to live in the property? So there's loss of use and there's additional living expenses. Um, uh, loss of use is going to be if someone has, uh, let's say, a medical ailment. Um, let's say they require power for oxygen or breathing treatments or whatnot. That could potentially be a loss of use situation. Or if a tree or something has fallen and, uh, and blocked access to the house, or if they're um, if they don't have access to get to the property, um, that's whenever loss of use would come into play. Uh, typically, loss of use uh, d a deductible would apply. Uh, for additional living expenses, um, a deductible may not apply, and it might um, still be accepted. 
But again, it's one of those things you're going to want to reach out to your carrier regarding your specific policy directly. All right, there were a couple of hands that were up that are down. I'm assuming, oh wait, we have another raised hand. Angie, go, you're up. Hi, Justin, I have another question for you. Um, I am in the Lafitte area that was damaged and a lot of people are asking me questions. They're getting ready to meet with their FEMA adjusters. And people are hearing um, information that if they, say for instance, all the homes are raised. And so most of us have what we call two storage buildings. We have one under our property and we'll have a separate storage shed or, you know, for our uh, recreational vehicles or the uh, husband's tools and so forth. People are saying that, and I was just wondering if this was clear, if this was true, that things that are in a separate building that's not attached to the house is not covered under FEMA. And they're asking if that is, is there any truth to that? In regards to the contents of the separate structure? That is correct. The contents in the separate structure. They're saying that a FEMA adjuster has told on several people that the items are only covered in the structure that is attached to the main house, the living area. But if it's a separate structure with things personal items in it that is not covered. Do you know if there's any truth to that or any type of information you can I, share? I would, I would certainly go based off of what the femur uh, adjuster is saying um, as they've looked at that policy or whatnot. Um, beyond that, if you want to look at a specific policy, you can email me directly, but um, I, I can't speak to that, to be honest with you. Okay, um, that, that was my that next I, question was, was I thought we just had one FEMA policy in, in the area, right, National, or is there, there's different FEMA, there's different uh, flood insurance in the area, or is it just one policy holder for the, for the area? There's just one, it's the National Flood Insurance Program has their, has their policy, and then there's about 52 different service providers, which could be Right Flood, uh, American Bankers, Assurance, you know, many different ones. And then there's also Private Flood. Um, email me directly and I'll get an answer to that question. I'll call my, uh, my flood representative and, and get the answer to that question. The biggest thing that you're gonna see that's gonna affect areas like Lafitte and Baratari and whatnot is um, a lot of those policies and properties they, they have super inexpensive insurance because they're rated based off of them not having a, an enclosure um, under those houses. And a lot of people have added those. Um, and that's where they're going to run into issues because the policies aren't going to be rated correctly. And they're, they're going to have issues with the claims process because of that. But you'll see stuff like that unfolding. But in, any questions directly, I mean, email me directly, justin at hmi.com. Or you can go to our website, Ladder Bloom Insurance dot com and, and get our contact information off of there as well. But I will get the answer to that question for you. All right. I have, I have one more that is a toss up. This might be a Justin and a Bob. Um, this came emailed to me. A friend's landlord asks renters not to be there when the insurance agent comes to assess damage. Uh, I'm assuming they're meaning an adjuster. Um, should the renter be there or not? And why would the land landlord say that? Now, on the insurance side of things, and that sounds like a big Bob question. Um, on the on the insurance side of things, I mean, the, the land the the tenant isn't covered under the policy, um, so I don't see why they would want that to be, other than if they want to, you know, not have any input and not have the renter tenant, you know, uh, take up the time of going over their story or whatnot. Yep. Um, you know, landlords should always ask or at least require that require or at least ask that their that their tenants get a renter's insurance policy which will cover their tenants personal property and then also create that uh, liability barrier of protection for them um but other than that i mean i don't see any issues with that i mean if if the house is uninhabitable um and the tenant can't live there because of that there could be um coverage for loss of rent but i don't see any other impact as to why the tenant shouldn't have to be there Excellent. Bob, anything you want to expand on that? The cynic in me <clears throat> says that the tenant may <laughs> may try to say, oh, it wasn't that bad and I can stay here and it wasn't, or it came in, it was, it, that was there before, that mold was there before, where the landlord might want to direct the conversation and and uh, and, and embellish the claims and, and, and make it make it worse. I mean, 
Look, uh, Justin, I know you're on this call, but but you know, you, the insurance company's job is sort of to mitigate the, the damages and, and what they pay you. And the insured's job is to try to maximize the claim and try to collect what they can. So sometimes they're not always on the same page. And, and sometimes the tenant will just talk too much and say things, or maybe the landlord doesn't want them to hear about the rent loss insurance that they might have. Not that the adjuster usually knows about that or talks about it, but, but in some, it's sort of a, it, it, it's sort of a, um, at the end of the day, that might simply be it. And, and I'll give a quick plug to insurance companies. It's, it's good to get a good insurance company. When, when a storm like this happens, you start to realize that there is a difference between one insurance company over the other. And when you can pay for better insurance, it makes sense. When you can pay for a better lender, it makes sense. And um, so that's just my, my, my kind of plug on it. You'll start to see what companies are good and what companies are not so good when, it, when, it, when a catastrophe happens. Well, let me tell you all, we had a lot of hands up. We had a lot of questions in the chat screen and we are going to end on time. Uh, that is a miracle. Um, I want to take this time, first of all, to tell, uh, to, to let Bob and Justin and Fred know how much we appreciate you taking the time to do that. I know that all of you are available to us all of the time, but not um, structured in a setting like this where we can answer, ask questions and have these answers help other people that are on there. I think at one point we're up to 140 that were on the call. And so I, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to answer those uh, questions for us. Um, there's a whole bunch of accolades happening, right? Uh, uh, thank yous and right. you're fabulous happening in the chat screen. Um, if anybody has one more burning question, one person can jump in. Otherwise, I am going to uh, close this out and um, and thank you. David, I just give a if I could just give a yeah. quick plug, guys. You know, this is where the power of Ladder and Bloom and the family of agents. I saw Susan on and and John on and, and David on and for organizing this thing. There are lots of agents that I find are kind of floundering around without any direction and knowledge of what to do. And then this, again, when times are great, it doesn't matter quite perhaps as much, but when things like this happen and you've got a consistency behind you, people, I mean, your property management groups across the street and they were back, Deb was back, back on Monday. We <clears throat> chatted with each other on Monday and, uh, and people getting back, but you've got, a continuity and you've got the strength behind it. My mom was a ladder and bloom agent for years and years and years. And so I know the, the company going back, but, but, but it's a great time to be with a company that supports you like this company does. So kudos and congratulations. Yeah. Thanks guys. Uh, always building and getting this kind of information allows us to uh, bring this back to our clients and give some clarity. Thanks guys. This is recorded. Tell all of your colleagues who didn't uh, tune in that you can uh, catch up with the recording. Or if you want to hear something that, that one of us said, um, tune back in and watch the recording. Jen, thanks for putting this together. Great. Thanks.